My name is Yüce Kabakçı and I was born in Izmir, Turkey, which is also known as Smyrna in the book of Revelation, one of the seven churches. And I was born into a Muslim family and my parents have always been nominal Muslims and um, they always stayed away from being uh, radical or more religious. So they never taught me how to be a uh, more consistent and good Muslim. Most of the time, my grandmother taught me how to memorize uh, the prayers in Islam. And most of those prayers, probably all of them, not most, are, um, are to be prayed in Arabic and not in your own tongue. Uh, so she would teach me these words that I didn't understand. But I would usually, I would usually, usually memorize them and pray them before I went to bed and uh, they would give me a sense of peace and comfort. Um, but that was all that I had as a um, training. In Islam, there's a tradition um, that they sacrifice a lamb every year, um, which is a, a, a commemoration of uh, what Abraham did. Um, and Quran tells a story as uh, Abraham sacrificing Ishmael um, to Allah. But, God, uh, but Allah um, saves Ishmael by sending a goat, by providing a goat. So Muslims, um, they don't necessarily sacrifice that lamb as an atonement for their sins, but to, um, as a tradition. I think Muhammad was really smart enough to uh, follow that line of thought in the Old Testament uh, because God promised Abraham that his, his seed would continue from Isaac, but not from Ishmael. As I was growing up, I would watch that event all the time, but I didn't know what it meant at all. But I would really feel sorry for the lamb who was slaughtered because um, it would usually become my friend as, as, uh, during that time. In high school, um, I didn't really like hanging out with my friends and, and do the same things that they did. I was kind of an oddball. I would usually sit in my corner and read books. And I found this book uh, by Rene Descartes, this, this course on method. And, and that book really sparked my interest, and I um, wanted to read other books like that. And I found books by Kant, Hegel, um, Spinoza, and um, I would usually spend my whole time reading those books. And by reading them, um, I started to set, set aside my Islamic beliefs and became more of an agnostic rather than an um, Islamic theist. I grew. Um, dissatisfied with the worldview that um, those philosophers provided because they all they all had the same goal and they all started with the same method but they ended up in uh, different conclusions so they weren't actually matching up with each other and um, I wasn't able to answer questions like why do we die and um, why do I have these uh, evil dispositions like lying, cursing, and I wasn't able to account for sin. And afterlife, um, basic questions about metaphysics, um, they were contradicting each other and they were contradicting themselves. And that's why I thought they were n they're not going to be able to um, give me any uh, satisfactory answer. But when I started my college education, um, I moved, moved out of my house and went to a different city. Um, it's in a Mediterranean part of Turkey and it's a very small uh, city. And I began to question my own beliefs about reality and, um, and religion and God. And as I was, I, I kept reading philosophers, but none of them um, were able to give me satisfactory answers to my questions. So I questioned my own uh, worldview and I decided to um, read the Quran. As, again and to become a more consistent Muslim. So I started reading the Quran every day and and I would um, I would practice um, almost everything I could, um, pray five times a day. I would read Quran hours and hours and hours every day and I kept seeing the names of Jesus, Abraham, Moses and David and and Quran really speaks of them very highly. And I want to read the Bible as well uh, to see uh, what the Bible says about them. 
Um, but at that time, my sister uh, moved to Chicago and she asked me to come to the United States to continue uh, my education, to do an MBA degree after I graduated from college. I was majoring in economics and that was a, I thought for a moment that that would be a good opportunity for me to come to the United States and convert those deluded Christians into Islam and to, um, and to bring them to the um, light. Uh, so I decided to find a Bible, but I looked for, um, for a Bible in the whole town and I uh, went to every single bookstore, but I couldn't find one. And I kind of gave up um, on finding the Bible and reading the Bible. And then later on, I had this um, really interesting dream um, in which I saw a, um, a man wrapped up with white clothes. Um, he was rising up from a grave and then he, he just walked away and then three women came up to that grave and said, he's not here, he's not here, three times. Um, when I woke up in the morning, I didn't understand what it was about. Um, it didn't make any sense to me at all. So I kind of let it slide and um, I didn't really think about it as much. And then one, after a month, as I was reading a newspaper, I saw this Bible ad. Um, they said, if you call us and we'll send you a free Bible. It's from a different uh, city. And I called them and they sent me a Bible, a New Testament, not the whole Bible. And I started reading the New Testament and I came to Matthew chapter 28, 27 and 8, and I saw the resurrection of Christ. It says, now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for free, fear of him, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he, has, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. As I read, read these verses, um, it was not exactly the same as my dream, um, because there was no tomb. It was a grave in the ground, um, because I had never seen a tomb before in my life. Um, but there are some of the words or sentences that I heard as the same in my dream, such as, um, uh, He is not here, for He is risen. I only, I only heard the part where He is not here, and I saw the faces of the women who were departing the grave, and they were, um, just like the Bible says, um, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they were leaving the, they were leaving the graveyard as, um, they were leaving the graveyard just like they were filled with joy, and uh, they had really a, an important thing to tell others. Uh, that was the end of my dream, um, and as soon as I read, read these passages, um, uh, I remember my dream exactly, uh, and I and I closed the Bible and I just dropped it on the floor, and then kicked it and then started praying as, um, please Allah, don't make me a Christian, uh, don't test me like this, and I don't want to be a Christian. I do not believe that God is limited by our conception of Him. Um, I believe in the stories uh, where there's no Bible, no church, no Christians. Um, God uses, still uses dreams um, or somehow visions um, to draw people to Himself. But in the end, um, He doesn't leave them at that point, just shows them a dream and then lets them uh, figure, figure everything out on their own. He also gives them other means. Um, he brings them the Bible, the Word of God. Because I do not believe that you can be a Christian just by seeing a vision or a dream. Um,
because they're not I've never seen or heard of a vision or a dream that tells the entire story of the gospel. Well, some would say that it violates the principle of sola scriptura, which I myself believe firmly. Um, but we need to be really careful about the, handling these issues. Um, the reason why I became a Christian was not because of my dream. It was because the Bible, the scriptures, testified to my dream. People dream about a lot of things today. My mom, my dad, they dream about Muhammad being descending from heaven. And um, we can't just um, settle the truth just by looking at the dreams themselves. Um, if they're verified by the scripture, and um, if there are no scriptures around them, no churches, no Christians, but then through the use of scripture, they um, recognize their dreams that, they, that it is from God. Um, there's only one way to recognize whether a dream is from God or not, if it is interpreted by scripture. That Bible sat down in a corner of my room for about three weeks. I didn't dare to even touch it. Uh, it became something of a, um, a magical thing to me. Uh, but then curiosity um, got me again and I just started thinking about it every day. And I picked it up again and I started reading it. I finished the New Testament and it seemed more like a story to me, especially the Gospels. I wasn't expecting it to be that way. Quran uses a different language than the Bible. Um, it uses a first person plural pronoun, we, uh, when, um, when you see the commandments or Allah talking to or giving revelation to Muhammad. Um, so throughout the Quran, it's, you see that language repeated over and over again, but in the Bible, it's different. You got letters got historical accounts so that was kind of a something that I didn't expect to see and I brought these two books to the theology department um, at my university in Turkey and that's an Islamic uh, theological institution and and I asked the professors to explain to me um, why there are so many differences between the two books uh, Quran says Jesus was not crucified but the Bible says he came to be crucified. Um, and there's no mentioning of resurrection in Quran, and resurrection plays a huge part in, um, in the Bible, in the New Testament. And they started telling me how, um, how the Bible had been corrupted over the years, especially in the second century. I was told that the corruption started taking place in the second century and when we came to fourth century with the Council of Nicaea, um, those professors told me that uh, the priests and the pastors um, put hundreds of Bibles on a table and they shook the table. And th the ones that were left on the table were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's how we got the four Gospels. And that was their whole theory. And I asked for uh, historical evidence to back that up. Uh, they weren't able to give me any historical evidence. Uh, they were just making up stories and possibilities. This could, this might have happened, and that. Um, so I felt really um, bad about their um, scholarship, and I decided to uh, solve this issue on my own because I also didn't want to be influenced by Christians either. Um, so I wasn't able to listen to my classes, lectures at college. So I. I stopped going to college for a while. I spent my whole time in a library trying to find some first century documents that would back up the historical records um, that are found in the Bible. And I read uh, Tacitus, Josephus, uh, some other um, encyclopedias about Roman history, Greek history, and Jewish history. And they were all talking about the same events at the same time um, and I was using the Gospel of Luke uh, for historical parts and and I found out that the, all of them Roman Jewish Greek even though they disagreed on certain issues um, they agreed on some historical facts and one of them was the crucifixion they all told the guy named um, Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah and who claimed to be the kings of the king of the Jews, he was crucified in Jerusalem, 
and that pretty much settled settled the question for me. Um, I was very convinced that what the Bible was saying about the crucifixion was historically reliable. And after that, things got harder for me because now I believe in the reliability of the New Testament and the Old Testament. But I was a Muslim, and I didn't know what to do. Um, I had to make a decision about who Christ was. And the Bible constantly tells us that He is God incarnate. And Paul addresses him as Lord. Also in the Gospel of John, after the resurrection, Thomas calls Jesus, my Lord and my God. But that idea to call Jesus as my God was a preposterous for me. And um, I was taught throughout my whole life that he's only a prophet. And Christians uh, make him out to be a God and worship him. And that's something that is um, strictly forbidden in Quran. And... Um, so I didn't know what to do about that either. Um, I, I kept reading the Bible, and the more I read it, the more I realized um, some of the inconsistencies that I had in my view of God. Um, I believed that I could earn my salvation, I could earn going to heaven by being an honest person, even trying to be an honest person. Um, uh, even if I fail, um, just that effort uh, would be enough for me to um, get to heaven. But as I was reading the Gospels, especially the Paul's letters, um, I had a different, I saw a different picture. And these verses really convinced me of the truth of Christianity and what Jesus claimed about himself. Um, it's in uh, John 8, uh, 33. It says, They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I had the same idea that the Pharisees had. Um, that I'd never been a slave to sin. I, I, I would sin here and there, but I was never a slave. But Jesus was telling me that, that I was a slave to sin whenever I sin. And, um, and also in the Gospel of Luke, when he was talking to Pharisees, he says, whatever is highly esteemed among men is detestable in God's sight. Um, those two, two verses, and especially reading the epistle to Romans, chapter 3, where Paul talks about um, our total depravity and how the entire human race fell with Adam in, in, in chapter 5. Um, those are the chapters and, and passages that really convinced me of my sinful nature and how I can please God on my own. And um, that part I was fairly convinced, but I was struggling with the idea of Christ's deity, whether he was God or not. But reading the Gospel of John and the reasons why Pharisees wanted to stone him over and over again uh, proved me the fact that he actually was either a liar who uh, was claiming to be a God or he was God himself. The idea of calling out to God as my father as Jesus taught, taught us, it was something phenomenal to me. I always saw God as the um, uh, some, sometimes merciful and most of the time uh, judgmental. And seeing God as Father and seeing His love through Christ and how Paul talked about Christ's sacrifice and how He fulfilled all the pr uh, promises and pr prophecies in the Old Testament uh, everything came into place, uh, but one night as I came back from a party, uh, a college party, um, I just sat down and, and thought through everything, and I looked back at the philosophers and how they, uh, what they gave me, basically there was, it was nothing, and I looked at Islam and it gave me nothing but fear. And I looked at the cross and I saw the entire world becoming more meaningful and I I was able to make sense out of metaphysics why why do I exist 
what happens when I die and why God is why does God judge or why does he reward and everything made sense in Christianity and the gospel message and I believe that night I cried out to Christ as my Lord and Savior after I became a Christian I went back to home um, for summer vacation I and my mother found the uh, Bible in my suitcase and she asked me what it was and I said mom that's that's the Bible and I became a Christian and she didn't believe what she heard and she asked me the same question three times again and um, and I repeated the same answer and then my, my dad came into the room and they all sat down and I started explaining them why I became a Christian and my dad didn't like what he heard and um, he said if you want to be called by that name Christian um, you ought to leave this house so um, I left the house for about several days and I stayed with a friend of mine after that uh, we sat down again and started talking about this and um, they let me live with them for a while and um, after seeing the changes in my life and the, the changes that I the, the, the changes in the relationships that I had with them um, that really changed their mind in a sense that they, my mom said uh, if that's the religion that changed this much then we're okay with it so now they respect my beliefs but they certainly don't want me to be involved in any type of Christian uh, work um, now I'm at seminary and they every once in a while they call me and they ask me to come back to Turkey and and get a secular job and be away from uh, any kind of ministry um, but I don't think I will obey them at this point in the Gospel of Luke um, in chapter 9 uh, verses 59 says uh, then he said to another follow me but he said Lord let me first go and bury my father Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Knowing these verses and other verses like these, um, just makes it impossible for me to uh, stay with them and um, compromise my faith and do whatever they uh, tell me to believe and do. In Turkey I saw a lot of evangelists uh, sharing the gospel with starting with the words God has a wonderful plan for your life and he shares the four steps of uh, becoming a Christian. It's against the nature of Christianity in Turkey because if God has a wonderful plan for my life then what about this what about martyrdom what about um, if I lose my job I'm gonna lose my friends I'm gonna lose my family what about all those things that I'm going to lose if I become a Christian that is not wonderful for a non-believer um, so I think that method or that way of sharing the gospel um, is not well suited for Turkey and instead of saying God has a plan God has a wonderful plan for your life we should make Christ the person who will make that plan wonderful for them Turkey is known to be the most um, unreached country in the entire world because um, in 1960s there was only one Christian in the whole country in 1980s numbers went up to several hundreds in 1990s uh, numbers went up to several thousand and now um, the numbers are around 4,000 um, evangelical converts from Islam the population is uh, 75 million and only 4,000 is uh, the number of Christians so um, that means only one person out of 32,000 knows Jesus um, as his or her uh, Lord and Savior. So there's a great need um, in reaching out um, 
the people of Turkey. And they're not only in Turkey, they're also in probably any part of the world, especially in Germany, Europe, in the United States as well. The number of churches in Turkey uh, probably close to 90. And most of them are uh, being pastored by pastors who are uh, not formally trained. Um, and some of them are not actually qualified to be pastors. And I feel that there's a great need in educated pastors and teachers to lay the uh, solid foundation uh, for generations to come. So with that in mind, I came to the United States to get my um, Master of Divinity degree at Westminster Theological Seminary. And um, <clears throat> after I graduate, I plan uh, on going back to Turkey and start planting churches and um, possibly um, uh, starting a seminary so that Turks um, can be trained in Turkey without having to go outside of Turkey to go through a lot of things to get their education. It, it really takes a long time um, to see the results of evangelism to Turkey. Um, you have to spend a lot of time with people that you're sharing the gospel with and you have to build relationships. It's a very relationship-based uh, country. Everything is centered around uh, relationships. Turkey was known to be the, um, one of the major centers of Christianity um, in the first century. Also, uh, the area known as Asia Minor was in the um, middle of Turkey. The events uh, that took place in the book of Acts and a lot of the um, missionary journeys of Paul uh, that are in Turkey, uh, the place where I became a Christian is actually very close to uh, Pisidian Antioch and um, there are some ruins of um, the churches that were founded by the apostles themselves. And three letters of Paul, letters to the Ephesians, letters to Galatians, and letters to the uh, Colossians, uh, they were all in, in Turkey. The seven churches in the book of Revelation, um, Ephesus, Smyrna, Laodicea, Sardis, um, Pergamos, uh, Thyatira, uh, they were all in um, now the Aegean part of Turkey today, and they're all in driving distance to each other. Well, everything centers in uh, Constantinople in Turkey, or today known as Istanbul. Um, it was the center of Greek Orthodox Church uh, during the time of Byzantine Empire. So in the 15th century, when Ottomans took over uh, Constantinople, um, Islam became the uh, the major religion of the region. Um, they also permeated through the entire country. And after 1453, when uh, the Ottomans took over Constantinople, Turkey became an Islamic um, country. If you read the Puritan um, authors, they usually name the Turks or Turkey as the, um, the tools of devil, tools of Satan. Um, but I don't share the same view with them. Not, not because I'm a Turk, but I believe that God has a, a unique plan for Turkey. Not only for Turkey, but for the entire world. When Christ said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, he did not say that just to, um, just to get his apostles excited about what he is doing, but he was giving us a reality that we should expect and hope for. And um, in the Old Testament, uh, the promises about the kingdom of God, the fact that Christ is bound to Satan and is spoiling his kingdom right now, gives me a hope that um, Christ will overcome all of his enemies in Turkey one day, and um, Turkey will become a, a Christian territory again, not for political purposes, not for any other purposes, but for Christ's kingdom and the righteousness will dwell in Turkey. I may not be able to see it during my lifetime, but I have to do my best to lay the foundations for that to take place in the future and give this worldview to other Christians so that they can strive for the kingdom of God, not just be pessimistic about it, not just uh, feel bad about when things go wrong, when they get persecuted, but they can rely on the promises of God, not what the newspaper says, what, not what um, they see their own, by their own eyes, but they should 
put the scriptures right in front of their eyes and see the entire world through that spectacle. Sadly, there is not a, a, a good biblical teaching about the end times or the, king, the nature of the kingdom of Christ in Turkey. Um, the ones who are teaching about this doctrine, they're teaching a more pessimistic worldview. The world is going to get worse and worse and worse, and then the Christ will come back and rapture us all again. In a sense, the pessimistic worldview about the end times is really damaging to the cause of missions uh, because they think that they, they can't do anything to change Turkey. They think that the Satan is the kingdom of the king of this world and um, there will be always a dualism between God and Satan and until the end. And when the end comes, then God will be the king and he will be the victorious one. So they think that the Christians who have this worldview, pessimistic worldview, think that they should not expect the church to flourish in the country um, until Christ comes. If you have that worldview along with the persecution, constant persecution, um, you will start to interpret what's happening in the church as uh, something unusual not to be something that that is not to be expected. God is still working. He's still fulfilling His promises. He's brought 4,000 Christians out of one. And now He's going to bring more elect um, out of Turkey. But when they have that worldview, that pessimistic worldview, they don't see those conversions. They don't see Christ's kingdom um, advancing as something... Uh, that is grounded in the Bible, but they say, wow, and they just leave it there. The ones who have this pessimistic worldview um, do not expect the Christ's kingdom to flourish in Turkey because um, they think that the world is going to get worse and they will always be a small minority in the country. In a, in a sense, it, this also affects their uh, evangelism, their missions, because they don't believe that the whole country uh, can be won to Christ. The freedom of religion is uh, protected by our Constitution. But in reality, through the use of media, um, government or any other organization or what have you uh, can influence uh, the society to take a stand against Christians or any other people group. So media has been depicting us uh, as um, as people who are trying to make Turkey as a Western nation, and for them we are traitors. Um, uh, we are seen as uh, people who were sold out to Western countries and uh, will work against Turkey. There actually have been some instances of martyrdom in Turkey. Um, as a matter of fact, the first Christian I ever met in my life um, he gave his life for Christ. Um, he was working for a Bible distribution company in the eastern part of Turkey in April 18, 2007. He and two of, his, uh, two of our brothers, uh, one of them was also Turk and the other one was a German missionary. And they all um, uh, gave their lives for Christ. On the morning of April 18th, 2007, um, these five men um, who had been visiting their church for, for quite a amount of time, they came to their office building and um, they went in and they started asking some questions about the Bible. And after that, they started tying them to chairs and they asked them to recant and say an Islamic prayer, which would make them Muslims. But my, my friends um, didn't want to do that and they stood for their faith and uh, they said Christ is our Lord and Savior and we will not deny Him. And um, after hearing that they started stabbing them uh, many times and uh, they slit their throat open and, um, and they tried to escape after that but they were caught. And after that I thought the church would um, decrease in, in numbers. In, for a time, it did. But if you look at the whole picture, um, I heard about 
people coming to Christ because of this event. They had never seen something like that in their lives and um, giving up their lives for something that they believe. And Tertullian also said that the, the, the blood of the martyrs is also the seed of the church. And um, there, there will be martyrs, maybe I'm the one who will be martyred next, but I don't believe that martyrdom will, um, will prevent uh, Christ's kingdom to um, advance. On, on the contrary, I believe that martyrdom will help us um, to, found, to found a really healthy church, to found a, um, a church that will challenge the entire country and change the entire country in the course of time. When you look at the history of missions in Turkey, um, you see there's a constant struggle. Um, uh, like I said before, in 1960s there was only one uh, Christian in the entire country. And now there are 4,000 and it, it happened, this happened in 40 years. And um, if we have that worldview um, and we, if we put that worldview into action, and not be lazy about what we believe and not be afraid about what we believe, then I believe uh, Turkey will be a Christian nation again, not politically, um, not economically, but by revival, but by regeneration of the spirit. Um, I think God will change the hearts of Turks um, in a radical way in the future. And um, I am really excited to be a part of this. And I know that where Paul walked and where Paul preached in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Laodicea, um, probably there are no Christians in those towns today, but there will be um, Christians who will be reading those passages of the Bible and say, and will be proud of themselves. Christianity was once the main religion of Turkey, um, starting from the first century and going up to the 15th century. But I do believe that it is going to be um, the main um, belief system in Turkey again. Um, when I look at the history of Turkey and how missions developed and how churches were pl planted, um, the places where you would have no hope for a church, no hope for Christianity, now there are churches in those towns. Now there are Christians who are trying to uh, evangelize um, their, um, their fellow men. Um, so I do believe that that number 4,000 today will not remain that way, but it will go up to millions. In eastern part of Turkey, a lot of churches uh, have been planted. And it's the same for west and north and south. Um, the places where Paul walked um, will, be, will be claimed for Christ again.